Hey Leute, ähm, wir sind mal wieder hier auf Lasergurkenland, dem gratis erreichbaren Minecraft-Server mit der PIC 9.202.127.134 alternativ auf die Domain silihung.com und wir schauen jetzt weiter das Video von John Hammond, äh, Improve Cyber Security Skills CTFs, äh, with CTFs, Pico CTF Walkthrough 2018. Wir sind bei 2 Stunden und 9 Minuten und John ist auf dem FreeCodeCamp.org Channel, der Link ist wie immer in der Beschreibung. So this challenge is called Leak Me for 200 points in the binary exploitation category. It says, can you authenticate to this service and get the flag? Connect with this, and you're given the source code and the binary. So I've downloaded both. Uh, I've got them here. Just, you know, see source code and a binary. So let's go ahead and mark that binary as executable, and let's go ahead and check out the source code. So they have a flag function that will just simply pop out the flag. Awesome. There is a main function that will allow a buffer to be created and set the uh, permissions so we can elevate our privileges once we actually run this on the server. And then it has a real password that's actually being able to read out with some buffers set up. Looks like it will create these buffers kind of by hand with memset, and it will ask, what is our name? Then we'll try and read our name with the length of the name, right, so 256. And interestingly enough, what it does here is it tries to check for the very end of our name based off where the new line is. So once we hit enter, it'll read in that new line, and if it goes ahead and finds that, if it finds the position, what it will do is it will go ahead and set that to a null byte character. If it's not there, then it will just say, okay, it's totally fine how it is. Uh, it will ignore it. So that's a peculiar thing, and that is where our potential vulnerability lead will be. Then it says, please enter the password. It will go ahead and open up the password and display it if it actually has it available. And the interesting thing is we can take advantage of this locally because we're actually seeing some string compares being used between the password and the real password. Ich habe kein Otherwise, if we get oh. the password, it will give us the flag. Keine Rüstung. So, oh mein Gott, go daran muss ich mich noch right? gewöhnen, dass ich nicht if überall runterspringen kann. Locally, we totally could. Let's say auth what my name John Hammond. I'm just kidding. My name is please subscribe. Password file is missing. So if we were to create a password.txt hier irgendwo war doch die Farm, oder? Was ist denn L-Trace? Wie geil ist das denn? Das muss ich mir nochmal anschauen. Das ist ja der Hammer. Es ist ja ultra OP. Wie tief ist denn das Wasser? Ich mach nur eins tief. 
I use print up so I could use the new line characters. Oh, you can just as easily use new, like commands of echo and put them together in parentheses and semicolons. I know I've done that before too, but it's whatever you're particularly comfortable with, I suppose. It really doesn't matter. More than a more than one way to skin a flag. <laughs> skin a cat. <laughs> skin a flag. That's I don't think that's how you say it, John. Skin a cat and legs. And we've got that challenge done and over with, 200 more points on the board. Next challenge is called Now You Don't, which is not too difficult, so I'm going to actually just bang it out in this challenge, in this video here. Let's mark leak me as... Sweet. Now let's make directory for Now You See Me. Or Now You Don't, I guess, I'm sorry. Oh, it exists, because I had to pre-download it. Yep. So let's check out what we have here. Just a PNG file. Let's check out what it actually is. Looks like a picture of just red. So, what challenge is this? Uh, it's forensics, whatever. I guess I'd consider this more steganography. Um, what we're going to use is just kind of actually verifying that that is all red. So, I'm going to go for my steg solve tool. Easy, low hanging fruit. If you don't have it, Google it. You can download it just fine. Um, it's just a jar file. So, what I'm going to do is locate steg solve. Let's grab it. Of attack jar to run it. Hit O to open files in the current directory and you say now you don't. Open the file. So we get red and we can view through all these different planes here. Or all these different ways of viewing the file. Once we get all the way to red plane one or red plane zero, you can see the flag. So let's go ahead and jot that down. Flag.text. Now you see. That's the joke. Now you see me, now you don't. Oh, why can't I? Five, three. Great. And that's that. So we can submit that. And we're cruising. Another win. Mark that challenge as complete. And if you want to have some money shop, I'll give you. This is the challenge Quack Me from Pico CTF 2018. Uh, I'm going to try and spend a little bit more deliberate, dedicated time to this because it doesn't have a whole lot of solves and I think tripped a few people up. So let's take a look. It says, Can you deal with the duck web? Get us the flag from this program. You can also find the program at this location on the shell server and we have a link to download it. So I can W get it if I wanted to. Uh, I've already got it downloaded though, so let's take a look at what we actually have to work with here. If I run this binary, it says you've now entered the duck web and you're in for a honking good time. Can you figure out my trick? Some input, let's just say please subscribe, and then it says that's all folks. So, okay, what do we do here? If we wanted to, we could check out the hints. It says up to dump or something similar is probably a good place to start. So this is in the reversing category, right? This is a reverse engineering challenge. The challenge is called Quack Me, and I think that that is a reference to a Crack Me, or as in kind of like, you know, binaries that are meant to be re reversed and understood, and just trying to uh, kind of manipulate it or trying to find out the key or the correct input that will actually solve it for you, like trying to pick the lock. So interesting thing. Let's open it up in Hopper, and that's what I'm going to use as my, uh, I guess, static analysis program here. Let's go ahead and open up the YouTube Pico for Quack Me. And let's jump to our main function over here, and I'll just check it out. I'm going to hit Alt and Enter so I can decompile it, or at least try and get pseudocode. So it sets a buffer up here that works just fine for us, displays this line of text, that string we saw earlier, and then tries to run this function called do magic, and then puts that's all, folks. So do magic is probably where magic's at. Let's go ahead and just copy this code because I want to be able to manipulate it. There's a lot here, right? So we want to be able to reverse engineer it. I'm going to work with it in Sublime Text just so I can actually handle it and understand a little bit more. So that way we can get syntax highlighting and it's, and it's nice and pretty and stuff. So this is our function, do magic. It looks like it takes in our input, this function read input. So let's set var14 to be our input. Good. And var10 looks like it's just taking the length of it. So let's change that length or that variable name to length of our input. I'm using control H by the way and then control alt enter just to be able to make rapid changes throughout the entire thing. It gets the stack pointer and it tries to allocate some memory with the length of our input 
and plus one, so probably a null byte at the end. So let's just say that bar C is actually uh, memory for our input. So we'll enter. And then if it is not zero, so if it's able to properly allocate it, it will jump to this location. And this location sets up memory for our input, length of our input, and it looks like it's trying to, okay, allocate. So initialize input, how about that? We'll just call that well, H initialize input. Sweet. So once we're initializing our input, we actually set some variables here that I'm just going to consider uh, var 18 and var 1c, whatever, we'll just call these zero since they're just being initialized to zero. We'll, start, we'll call them zero for now, and then if we understand them anything, anything more later, then we can change the name. And this can also be a zero there. Nope. Zero bar two. Okay, and then we go to this location. So this location tests if EAX is zero bar, length of our input, otherwise it will go to some location. We'll go to dot L1. Where's that at? Oh, so go to, let's call that dot l1 can just be end function for like. So if our length of input, if ex is our length of input, we go to this location. This location will do something. It's like it's testing zero message. There's a zero bar two added onto our greeting message and the memory address is zero message. So it's trying to get a specific character out of the greeting message and it's anded with zero XFF. So it's just going to be a single byte. And if it's all equal to our input plus zero bar two, so zero bar two must be doing something. Looks like it actually, okay, that's got to be an iterator, right? We can actually see this location down here. Increment. So let's, let's just change this to... Increment iterator. And then zero bar two will actually just be called our iterator. And then it will go back to, okay, test. Go back. If after it's iterated, we'll go back to test length. PX is equal to left in our input. And otherwise it will go to. So length of our input must be 0x19, right? Because it's zero bar. another zero bar, so this got to be another iterator. Where else is zero bar being used? It's not. Oh, which is being used as a counter to determine whether or not we're going to continue to iterate. So we have a loop here, right? Like we, I think we can kind of generally understand it. It's trying to iterate a number over our message and our input, trying to get a value there. And it looks like it's trying to XOR that, you can see the symbol here, with our iterator at a specific memory address. So we have some bit of memory that we're testing this with, and it's XOR with our input. So properties of XOR, right? We've got the greeting message that we're looking at, and our input, and some address in memory. So let's find this address in memory. It's got to be something that we can retrieve. And that XOR with our greeting message should be ich what mich, ob hier the input we need to supply. So we can figure out the crack me if we just XOR greeting message and memory at just location. Let's do it. Okay. Looks like we, and then, okay, we would display you're a winner if we get the flag there. So there's something peculiar. Let's, let's see if we can go back to Hopper and then get this information out of there. Well, let's say greeting message. And where is that? That's got to be probably that you've now entered the duck web. If we view this in Hopper, can you go by trick? Yep. It's in main and it's also noted as reading message. So that is the string that we have here. And if we're going to actually use XOR, we can probably just go ahead and create a get flex script in Python where we know we're going to XOR them. I'm going to use phone tools to XOR them. So let's use user bin environment Python. Let's say reading message can equal that. Let's use double quotes, and we don't need that backslash. And let's use it as for real, for real there. Let's import pwn. If you don't have pwn tools, you can just install it. Um, find online. 
I cover it in a ton of other videos, but it helps it helps XOR things very, very easily in Python. So now we want to know where that memory address is. So back in our Sublime text, let's go ahead and steal that address so we can go to it in Hopper. So I've just copied and pasted it, and then I click Control G, or just simply G, and paste it in to go to that address. And you can see, oh, it's right, it's right here. So secret buffer, huh, peculiar, right? Let's go ahead and copy all this. And I would go ahead and scrape out the ASCII, but note that some of it is noted as a, as a just a simple period. That's probably because it's not a printable character, even though with that in hex it is something right there. So we do want that in hex handle. Let's go ahead and try and carve that out in, Py in Python. I'm actually just going to do sublime text, 0x dot dot. So once I hit and select all those, let's do find all. Delete everything else, paste them. Oh, I'm sorry. So find all, control X to cut them. Now they're all there. Now I've got them all. And then that 0x I'll replace with a backslash x. And I'll replace all the new lines with emptiness. So now I've got a Python string that I can handle and use in Python. So let's say XOR string can equal that. And let's try and use own to print XOR greeting message and the XOR string. XOR them together. Pico CTF, quack me. We just got the flag. Awesome. Cool. So that was it. That's it. That's all we needed. <laughs> Looks like that that is the flag that we want here. Let's actually just import our read. Let's do re.findall pico ctf get our flag format set up, carve it out and let's make that lazy so it doesn't get all of it great, there's our flag let's go ahead and submit that and we've solved crack me or an interesting crack me challenge normally when you see crack me is the first kind of start of them but some of the simple ones we'll just try and do an XOR operation um, but I hope that was kind of fun and kind of cool to literally take apart that, uh, like, this function here, this do magic, and then just kind of change the name. Just follow through it and try to understand where it's going and how it's going there, why it's going there, what it's doing, and just changing these variables so they make a little bit more sense. And that's, I think, a good thing to do when you have a big, you know, like a, a big function that is seemingly doing something interesting, like magic, as it says, and you could use that to figure out what's really going on. So, cool. Did I submit it already? It did. All right. Shape so code. this is worth 200 points. It got mediocre solved, I think, by your exploitation challenge. Uh, we've seen this before in Pico CTF 2017. It doesn't seem to be too difficult. It's just a matter of finding some proper shellcode. So if you don't know what shellcode is, you can simply Google it. But it is just kind of essentially machine code, right, for like, uh, like ops, Intel processor instructions, or, or compiled bytecode to do things, to uh, actually make a program like actually do something else that it wasn't intended to do, like properly give a shell usually, that's why it's kind of called shell code, but it's got, it can do other things, right, just making it do something else. So this program executes any input you give it, can you get a shell? You can find the program here in the source code, on the shell server, blah, blah, blah. So you can download this stuff. I've got it downloaded here, and we can mark it as executable if we wanted to. And then we can actually check out the source code. So, not really all that interesting. Just we know that okay, it's going to go ahead and execute whatever we give it in a buffer, like as if it were code, as if it were like compiled instructions. So let's try and see if we can track down shell code. Let's. We want to get a shell, right? So, a resource that I use for this is shellstorm.org, and their shell code actually has a page for a lot of interesting stuff. And let's say we're working on Intel x86, right, but we are working on Linux. So let's find something that will execute bin bash or bin sh or whatever the case may be, something that will actually go ahead and give us shell. There are a lot of options here. I like to have something that uses tag p, so it keeps privileges just fine. Um, and let's look for that. Exec VE and that looks perfect. 33 bytes. 
So what we care about is this hex, right? The actual machine instructions and, and opcodes and assembly. So let's go ahead and paste those in to Sublime Text. I'm gonna cut up those new line characters and quotes, so and all the spaces as well. So that way we just have that in Python. And then what I will do is I will have Python print that out. So I'll use print, paste it in here, and then that's essentially running bit bash. Let's go ahead and give that to the vuln function. And it says thanks, executing now. But it closes right away. So why is that happening? Well, we are capturing kind of the, the input that, that, that bash or the shell is waiting to receive. So what we can do is we can actually execute our payload and then immediately following it, so I'm going to wrap these in parentheses, right, these commands here. Immediately following the execution of our payload, we'll open up cat, we'll run cat. So standard input will remain open, and that stuff will actually go to the bash shell. Oh. So I can run ls, here am I. Yeah, Leute, ohne Rüstung, Rüstung ist echt hart. So, now this, this is happening on our local box. We want to be able to see how we can get it on the shell server. So what we'll do is go ahead and connect to it and move to that directory. I've got that ssh.script that I created earlier, so I can simply run that and log in. I have mistyped my password. Yep, I failed. I'm sorry. I failed. I failed. I'm John Hammond, the fail will. Let's change the directory there, and let's copy and paste that payload that we have here. We've got bone visible, and we can just run that payload. And now we're executing bash. Run ls, see who I am. I'm still the user, but I have the privileges to now read that flag.txt file. And we've got flag. So that's simple, right? We've kind of done that before in Pico CTF 2017. Uh, just a matter of tracking down shellcode and knowing what will do what, what will actually kind of work for us. Uh, I've tried to use Pwn tools before to generate some shellcode, but I never seem to get it right. Uh, I think there are some tricks and tips to make, actually, actually make that happen and make it do the right thing. But when I just need to grab a shell and I don't have a, a huge limit in the amount of bytes I can put in, I just use Shellstorm because uh, it's an awesome archive and a really good resource for a crap ton of shell code. So. The challenge problem here is to be successful on your mission, you must be able to read data represented in different ways, such as hexadecimal or binary. Can you get the flag from this program to prove you're ready to connect with this command here? So I'm going to go ahead and connect to this, and it's kind of a long thing, right? If, if I just go ahead and go here, since we're going to start at the very beginning and make sure you understand how data is stored. Doctor? That's weird. Um, if I input that? Oh, shoot. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sometimes I, I've noticed peculiar things in some of these services from Pico CTF where we'll give the answer or like what it's expecting just kind of at the front of the service. Uh, so we will ignore that, 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 that did correctly make that one right away. Um, the next one is give me this information as hex, as a word, etc. So right now, see, we're given binary, and it wants it in, as an ASCII word. Next, we're given hex, and it wants it as an ASCII word. And we'll keep moving up from that. So let's just write a script to be able to do this, because it says, to make things interesting, you have 30 seconds. So it's trying to encourage some script. But now that we, now that we've actually interacted with the service, let's go ahead and like, work. Let's create a Python script. Uh, Leute. Deswegen immer ein Wasser dabei haben. Also diese Pflanzen da sind echt irgendwie nervig. Uh, okay, we get the binary just like that. So, 
Leute, what? Nein, nein. Ich hab das. Ja. Seven or something? No. Oh, well, wait, no, it's because I'm an idiot. You can't concatenate all those things and put them together. They are different numbers in the, on the row. So, let's. We do want to interpret all of these as octals. There we go. What else must I do? strings. We can only get the flag. Did I do that wrong? Maybe I did. Let's do from home import all. I must just do one more thing. What the heck is going on? Is that because it's... Alright, well, I don't care. I tried to test it a little bit, but it doesn't really matter. As long as we're still getting the flag just like that. So 
interesting note here. The flag is just noted as uh, delusions about. Oh, oh Marcus is here. The flag is delusions about finding values, and I think that's a callback to delusions of grandeur, which is a. Oh, jeez, I don't, I don't like that. That's stupid. I'm sorry. It's a callback to Delusions of Grandeur, which is uh, one of the Air Force Academy, like, CTF player names. So, I mean, that's a reference between Martin, like, Mr. Carlisle, who was working there and was originally an instructor at uh, USAFA, US Air, US Air Force Academy, is now with Pika CTF and the Carnegie Mellon team. Uh, I think he's at, I don't know for sure, I may be wrong, I don't, I don't want to speak on his behalf, but I think he's working now at Carnegie Mellon, which is crazy cool. Uh, and a lot of the USAFA grads are actually some of the developers. Uh, for Pico CTF and that have been have been some of the problem developers and problem leads. And I know those guys, which is pretty cool. So hey, shout out to you. I love you guys. <laughs> Hope to see you very, very soon. This challenge is called You Can't See Me, 200 points in the general skills category. It says reading transmission, you can't see me transmission. And maybe something interesting lies in this location. So it's on the file server, right? It's on the shell server. So let's go ahead and connect to it. Uh, I'm just going to run my ssh.sh script, go ahead and type in my password so I can log in, and let's change directory to that location. If I ls, there's nothing in the directory, so I figured, like, well, let's check out hidden files. Let's ls a. And you can see there is a period for the current directory, uh, two periods for the parent directory, just as you always see in ls a. Uh, and those are noted in blue with ls colors because they, they were folded, right? Um, but we have an interesting thing where we have this other period file. So if I want to try and cat it out, I, I wouldn't be able to just like cat period. I said, well, it's a directory, that, that doesn't work. Can I try and cat this directory here? No, it, it, it still considers a directory. So weirdness, right? I can cat all, no, there's nothing here. Cat start on all, or period dot all, it, that works okay for me. That will be able to interpret stuff that is starting with the period. Another thing that I tried was like rep tag r, with period, period doesn't mean the file that we're looking for, but it means the pattern that we're looking for. And I'm using regular expressions, so it'll match anything. And tag r means recursive, so all the files that you see, and that will receive it here. Note that it's a period in a couple spaces. So if I wanted to run like cat period backslash backslash, then it will read it out, because I needed a backslash space and backslash space to actually like interpret those spaces in there. I could cat dot space space, and that would read it out and you wouldn't need the, the period to start because the, the space will work. But again, it has to be in quotes to denote that. So interesting thing, right? Anyway, we got the flag. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. That challenge is complete. And we're good to move on. Mark that challenge as complete. Let's go ahead and paste it. Sweet. Next challenge is called buttons. It says, there's a website running at this location. Try to see if you can push their buttons. So. We have buttons. It says, push me, I'm your only hope. It says, you did it. Try the next button, button two. It says, oh, whoa, I'm getting rigged roll. Holy crap. <laughs> I can't show that. I'm going to get a copyright strike. <laughs> it says, form disabled. This incident has been logged and reported at dev. No. So let's check out this page here. It says, form action, button two dot PHP. It looks like there isn't anything here, but it is trying to post to button two dot PHP. So, Let's see if we can just actually just make that request, right? We can probably just take button2.php, take that URL, and run that curl command with it. Make directory buttons, CD buttons. Oh. Let's run curl and then tag x to specify the method. Hmm. Post. And let's also wirklich effektiv ist das ja nicht, awesome. oder? It just pumps out the flag. Cool. Let's go and reverse it so I can just cut tag d get the very last field of spaces and then reverse that back. We don't need all that output from curl, so that works just fine as our get flag script. Bin bash. Mark it as executable. Redirect that to a flag.txt file. Sweet. Copy to our clipboard. Clip, not clean up. And we can submit that. So, awesome. Not too hard, right? Those are interesting challenges, kind of a, a cool trick, an interesting thing, but just kind of being observant and really looking at what you have in front of you, you'll be able to kind of piece it together and, and have that intuition to know what to do with it. So you could do this with curl, you could have done this with Python requests, you could do this with probably like developer tools if you wanted to, fire up some F12 in your browser. But hey, 
Hope you guys enjoyed. Hope you like watching this. This is a video write-up for the challenge EXT Super Magic from Pico CTF 2018. My name is John Hammond, and let's just dive right in. This challenge does not have a whole lot of solves, and I think it was kind of a, a really struggling point for, for a lot of people. It's in the forensics category. It says we solved a we, we sorry we salvaged a ruined EXT or X, X Super Magic two class mech <laughs> recently and pulled the file system out of the black box. It looks a bit corrupted, but maybe there's something interesting in there. You can find it at this location on the shell server, and we have a download. So you can download it with wget. Uh, I've got it in my file system already. I've downloaded it already. And <coughs> what do we do with this, right? Like, it's, it's a forensics challenge, so we can run foremost on it. We can see if we've got anything in there. Uh, so JPEG, right? EOG, all these things. But there's nothing good or particularly visible here. Uh, you can try and re like make out some text, but all it's trying to tell you is that uh, your flag is in another file. <laughs> so this is a, a rabbit hole and a red herring. Just kind of sucks. Wasn't wasn't very good for us. So bin walk, right? Strings. Or anything we could do to try and get some information out of this. Uh, exit tool. Nothing really good here. Uh, Flag.jpg. Could I unzip this kind of thing? Like what? Like what? We didn't. I didn't know what to do with it. Um, so. I checked the hints, right. You can do that. It's Pico CTF, that's cool. They say, are there any tools for diagnosing corrupted file systems? What, did they, what, do, you, what do they say if you run them on this one? Sorry for my stutter. Getting all excited here. So this is FSCK, <laughs> uh, file system check. And we could run this on it, right? We could just simply run FSCK and try and tap autocomplete. Um, but it would normally just try and want to run it on some of the, your devices. Um, so if I tried to ls and were to give it simply this, it wouldn't want to work with it. Um, I admittedly didn't know, like, okay, what do I, what do I supply here? I don't know anything about this thing. Do I need it? Do I need to give it a super block or a block size? I don't often use file system check. But I kind of noticed something in that this was ext4, fsck file system four. So I try to see are there any other FSCKs that I can work with, FSCK.ext2, that seemed to be a thing, so maybe I could run that on the EXT Super Magic, it seemed to want to work with it, and it seemed okay. It read it just fine, but it told me everything that I kind of expected, like okay, it's, it's corrupt, it's broken, there's something wrong. Uh, bad magic number in super block, super block invalid, bad magic number in super block. So this rings a bell, right? Knowing the challenge prompt, knowing what it is that we're actually working with here, called EXT, like super magic. Maybe EXT has got to be the file system, super's got to be the super block, and magic number has to be the super block thing. It's probably say two class because it's EXT two. We could have tried EXT three or whatever we wanted on it, but I knew that one kind of run like rang a bell. Looks like both would work. Nice. EXT four hmm. handles it just fine as well. Weirdness. So. Now we kind of have a little bit more of an objective. We know that the super block is kind of corrupt. The, it has a bad magic number. That's why if we were to run file on this, it won't tell us straight up, oh, it's an EXT file system. It, it won't tell us what kind of file system it is or what kind of file it is, it just thinks it's data. So what I did from there was I tried to kind of Google and look around. I figured EXT2, EXT2 file system, super block magic number, as you could see in my history already, super block magic number. And you can see some research that I did. I went straight to a Stack Overflow, Super User, whatever the case may be, and I read this thing, this article, where they said, okay, they had a corrupt file system. The magic number was broken. And they say the magic number is a sequence of bytes used in all files in certain formats. Usually the given position, typically the beginning, that kind of note the signature or the fingerprint of that file. So when we're applying this to a file system format, for example, ext2, ext3, ext4 file system always has the bytes 0x53 and 0xef at positions 1080 and 1081. So good to know, right? Maybe that is something that's wrong. We can go ahead and check that out. If the file command were to run on it, it would be able to recognize that by those magic numbers, then it would properly tell us it's an ext file system. But since it didn't, maybe this is wrong. So let's go ahead and check it out. I don't know if hex edit will be particularly what we want to use right now because uh, we'll see the position just in hex. Yeah, that, that's no good. 
I want to go ahead and try and run this with like Gex or something, EXT, Super Magic. So now I have a, a specific one that I can go ahead and go to. So uh, a GUI uh, that I can use, and I can hit Control J or from the, the file menu to go to Byte, and we want 1080 and 1081. So let's go to 1080, and now my cursor's there. But you can see that it is not 0x53 and EF, so let's change those. Let's do 0x53 and 0x EF. Great. Now I can save this, save buffer to EXT Super Magic Image, and now if I go ahead and check this out, throw a file on that, it says it's a Linux file system. Okay, let's try and extract this, or not extract it, I'm sorry, but mount it now. I don't know if Foremost will actually work on it any better now. I don't think it will, but we can go ahead and mount it. Let's just create a mount point directory. Mount, <laughs> mount, mount, sorry. Uh, let's, let's correct that just for, just for good sake. Uh, and we'll go ahead and mount this file at the mount point right here. And we will need to be root, so let's sudo that. Enter my password here, and now I have mount point. So let's cd there. See what we have? Well, lots of stuff. Will flag.jpg actually open for me? It will. You can zoom in here. Interesting picture. <laughs> Your flag is this. So let's take note of that. I didn't mean for that. Let's split. Let's move up in the directory, get it in the proper place, and let's run nano for flag.txt. Try and type out our flag. Pico CTF A7 DB29 ECF. 7BB9960F0A19F2E9D00AF0. Yep, okay. Again, your flag may be very different than mine because of Pico CTF's random generation. So keep that in mind. Did I type it right? I really pretty hope so. I think I did. Yeah, all right, cool. So that was that. Uh, I struggled on that challenge for a long time, and I think a lot of people did. Like, don't don't hesitate. Like, don't be ashamed. No worries if, if you did. Look at how many people solved this challenge. So I it took a lot of time, right? But that's the point of a capture the flag. You bang your head against the wall over and over and over again. Just you don't give up. You keep trying. Offensive Security's logo. And eventually you'll, you'll track something down. Research is good. Finding different tools are good just trying to figure out what you can do to examine this from many different angles and many different perspectives and see you get something. So let's mark that challenge as complete. We did it. This challenge is called The Vault for 250 points in the web exploitation category. It says there's a website running at this location and here's a link. Try and see if you can log in. So we can view the website. It has a simple login page and it actually gives us some source code, so we can check that out. Looks like it is running PHP, uh, displaying errors, and error reporting is on. Includes the configuration file and some database that it's trying to open up. It actually reads in our username and password, also a debug variable that we can specify, and then it actually tries to use a query with select one from users where name is equal to something and password is equal to blah. Okay, so we have potential SQL injection, right? Like, it's just concatenating in, or at least placing in our variables. It's actually not doing anything to sanitize them in the query. However, when it's displaying them with the debug value, it will actually just go ahead and display the special characters with it. So it, it, it tries to de it, like HTML entitize it as necessary. So we won't particularly need this because I think we're smart enough to know, well, we know our SQL injection vulnerability. Let's totally take advantage of it. They do something interesting here, though, because they have a validation check. They try and use some regular expressions determine if we're using an OR syntax. So like we're used to a SQL injection where OR 1 equals 1. Looks like they'll test if we actually see that. If we see that pattern at all in the username, or interestingly enough, the password match is still running in the username field. So we could determine, well, password is going to be equal to, we can actually inject in there if we can to the username. Peculiar thing. And if the user match and password match is not equal to 1, if it actually returns some location, in the preg match, it will determine it. we detected SQL injection. So, peculiar. Interesting note, though, that it's not testing it in the password. So, let's go ahead and see what we can do. We would try a regular SQL injection, or 1 equals 1, comment, comment, and SQLI detected. 
But let's change this. We could say anything for our username and try or one equals one of the password, we log in. That works just fine for us. Another interesting thing is just selecting anything from, let's say, probably the users, right? We know there's very likely going to be a admin user. So if we had just had that username and then commented out the rest of the query, we could log in just like that. So I don't know if it actually has anything not in there. Okay, so no, we have to have an admin account. It was worth, it was worth trying, it was worth figuring out. But those are the two easy ways to win that I saw. You can use the or syntax in the password field because it's not testing that, or you could use it in the username, just go ahead and use the admin and then query out or comment out the rest of the query. So now that we have the flag, we can go ahead and submit. But let's write a simple get flag script for this. It looks like it's just paste, uh, pasting this, I'm sorry, wow, posting this to login.php. So let's go ahead and make a little curl thing for that. Not too hard, right? We can use curl, this location, let's say tac -tac data. Um, username can equal, let's say, admin hyphen hyphen, and it gives us the flag just like that. So, rep, tag OE, wow, caps lock, what are you doing? Not welcome here, get out of my house. Color equals none, and make curl silent. Great, there is our simple one liner. Awesome get like scripts. Just encapsulating our answers. That's all. <coughs> Flag.text. Throw in our clipboard. And we can submit it. The next challenge is called What's My Name for 250 points and is in the forensics category. It says, Say my name, say my name. And we can download this file. So I've actually got this already moving, got it downloaded already, and it is a PCAP file. So if I go to what's my name, we have myname.pcap, which is a TCP capture file. We can open this thing up in Wireshark and explore it just like you would with any you know, actual PCAP, but there's a lot in here. And it's doing some DNS stuff, I'm assuming. That's probably why it's trying to get a hold of the what's my name thing. And, uh, the name server of an IP address or whatever the case may be. Uh, I didn't care to look through this because all I did was a simple please let me out of Wireshark. Let me out of Wireshark. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Alright, fine. I just ran strings on this, right? Pretty easy. And usual, usual, usual technique, usual little weapon that we go for here. Look for our flag format. Carve it out, and if we find it, we win. So just like that, not a hard challenge. Uh, just kind of knowing, let's go for the quick cut corners thing. Make a simple get flag script for that. Flag.text and exclamation. Find out anything. Right, submit. Man, we're cruising. No mit Wasser. This challenge is called Absolutely Relative. It's in the general skills category. It says, in a file system, everything is relative. Can you find a way to get a flag from this program? You can find it here on the shell server, and we have the source. So, this is something that is necessary to run on the shell server, so I'm just going to go ahead and connect to it there. Um, but I do want, actually, the source code so we can check out what it's doing. Let's wget this, and let's open it up. All right, so character yes <laughs> should be just simply yes as a constant. Uh, yes length should be three, interesting. We have a main function that will read the flag. It has a create a buffer for it for permission, etc. Uh, um, it'll open up the absolute game. path to problems Can that application and flag.txt. So flag.txt will open up. Oh my goodness. It'll what go is this physics? But the Jesus. The permission file is actually relative. It's doing it from the current directory. So that's peculiar and something to note. Um, if file, it'll, okay, it'll read through the permissions and actually determine information out of it. Just read it. And if the string compare permission is yes and yes, so if, if the length of yes, if we've actually read the permission.txt file to say the word yes, it'll say you have right permissions, it'll give you the flag. 
if you do not have specific permissions or the sufficient position permissions, it will not give you the flag. So, because the permission.txt is read out of a relative location, we can control it. And oh, let's go here, the no? cool thing here. Let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, we have the location on the shell server that we want to connect to. So, I'm going to dot .ssh over there. I'm just using my script that just enters the command for me. Have I in the new bed yeah, yeah. So, I can simply enter my password and jump in. And we have the fly.txt, the absolutely relative file, absolutely relative.c, etc. So we can't view fly.txt. Can we view permission.txt? But we don't even have it. Weird. You're not on specific permissions or the sufficient permissions to view this flag. We can't create a permissions.txt, can we? Nope. Permission deny. I don't have the permission to do this here. I can try and write yes, but it won't let me save the file. So we can now move to some place where we do have right permission, like the temp directory. Let's try and temp uh, JH yes. YouTube, and let's go there. Temp JH YouTube. Great. Now let's go ahead and create a symbolic link. And I've done this a lot in some Bandit or Leviathan or uh, some over the wire war games where I create a symbolic link to the absolute file here, the, the, the program that we're trying to run in its absolute location. Let's get the absolutely relative program in this directory. So now I have a like a special kind of blue, an absolutely relative file that is in this current directory, but is a symbolic link or kind of like a shortcut to that real absolute location of the program. So now I can create a permissions.txt and I can have it say yes, just fine. Now if I run absolutely relative, it says you have write permissions because it's trying to read the permission.txt in the current directory that I am in. So I can create the permission.txt file, it'll read it just fine, and it'll give me the flag because of the this power of the source stick. So that's that, right? Pretty simple, pretty cool. You can go ahead and mark that as the flag and say that this challenge is complete. Let's go ahead and submit it. And that's just a neat thing. Uh, symbolic links are very, very cool. And when you have control over a shell server or you have a location where you can have your own files and have your own space, it's it's really neat. So, so the challenge problem here is what does ASM2 with these arguments return? Submit the flag as a hexadecimal value, etc. We've kind of seen this thing before. So we're given some source code. Let's go ahead and copy it, download it, and I'll just w get it into the current directory here. Looks like we have it there. I'm gonna open it up at Sublime Text. I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see this. And I'm gonna change the syntax highlighting to assembly. Oh, so doing... what I'm gonna do is actually create a new script that uh, will kind of recreate this in Python. So let's do like recreation.py or something or whatever we particularly want. I use the file header plugin for Sublime Text to get that boilerplate stuff uh, at the very top there. But okay, what we do is Analyzing the assembly, let's say this is function prolog. I'll keep zooming out, hopefully you can still see. Function prolog, and then we set eax to the second argument, 0xc, right? Because ebp plus 4 on the stack is just going to be our return address, I believe. Uh, ABP plus 0x8 will be the first argument, 0x plus xc is the second argument. Again, incrementing by 4 because that's the size of the data type there. Let's just include this as a comment so we know that EAX will equal the second argument, 0x21. So let's say Python can do that as well. And let's do the next line where we're setting EBP minus 0x4. So a local variable set to EAX, which we know to be 0x21 still. And let's just say that can be EAX in the Python code. We'll do the same for the next argument. So EAX can equal just the first argument we give it to. Oh, see, yeah, not eight. bad. Don't laugh. And just using not, not not using this because that's the same value here, but using it because it's the first argument that we're passing to this function, uh, EBP with a base pointer plus 0x8. So once we set EAX, we'll do the exact same thing just as we did previously with a new local variable. We can say EBP minus 0x8 will be able to equal 0x8 in this case. 
and we'll do that just as we did earlier in Python. Set it equal to EAX. Before we did it, we have to set EAX to equal this. So that's just creating these local variables for us in our stack or from the stack in the very start of the function. And then we jump to part B. So to part B. So part B, what it's doing is it's testing as a compare statement here, or compare instruction, and less than or equal to. So let's do if EBP plus 0x8, so our argument here. We actually don't have a variable for that yet, so let's go ahead and create one. Because underscores are going to be minus in this case. So let's do minus here and minus. So now we can have EBP minus, or plus, sorry, for arguments. That can go ahead and equal the first argument that we give it, the second argument that we give it. And in fact, we could have just be setting these here rather than using the hard-coded values. Okay, so now let's test if EBP plus 0x8 is less than or equal to this value. If it is, we are jumping to part A. Otherwise, we are setting EAX to equal EBP minus 0x4, and then we will just print out EAX to see what it is we actually need here. Because that's the end of the function, right? There's our function epilogue down at the very bottom. Okay, so part A we need to actually look at. Now, what it's doing is it's setting EBP minus 0x4, so that local variable, and it's adding 1 to it, so plus equals. So part A will take EBP minus 0x4 plus equals 1, and then EBP plus 0x8 will also be added with a 0xA9. So it's just incrementing. So it looks like it's trying to do some kind of loop, looks like it's trying to do some kind of division, I think, because it's testing, okay, whether it's a factor this however many times, blah, blah, blah. But since our Python code should be able to handle it just fine, let's go ahead and run it. After we set EBP plus 0x8 plus equals 0xA9, so when I run this, we get 8. Okay. Let's see what we look like here. Is EBP correctly being set here? Uh, looks like if we try and debug this here. No, it's not. So something is wrong in our code. We are... Let's check out what EBP minus 0x4 is. Oh, ich habe hier Essen hier, lol. 33. <lacht> ich struggle mir hier einen ab mit der Essen. Oh mein Gott. Oh, Leute, ich bin durch. Oh. Ich glaube, das war's dann. Das war's mit der Folge. Oh. Nicht vergessen hier auf Lasergucknet, IP steht ja hier 149.21.1.7.s34, alternativ domainsilihun.com, gerade erreichbarer Anarchie-Server Lasergucknet. Das Video, das wir geschaut haben, ist uh, Improved Cyber Security Skills with CTFs, Pico CTF Walkthrough 2018 von John Hammond, aber hochgeladen auf dem freecodecamp.org-Channel. Link ist wie immer in der Beschreibung. Ciao.